Right, so let me just remind you briefly what we were talking about at the end of last week. I introduced the postulates of special relativity. Yeah, we talked about them, explained how they were motivated, and explained what they are. So there are two postulates. The first one is the constant speed of light. So what this means is, if any inertial observer measures the speed of light in the vacuum, he will always get the same answer, okay? no matter his own velocity. And number two was this principle of relativity. Um, which was discovered by Galileo. And in short, it says that there's no physical difference between being stationary and moving with a constant velocity. Okay. So if you do an experiment at rest in some reference frame, or you do the same experiment moving at a constant velocity, then the results of the experiments will be the same. You can't physically distinguish the two. Okay, right. And the thing I said at the very end of last time is that this one, the constant speed of light, contradicts the Galilean transformation. of velocities. So the reason is very simple to understand. Suppose that I'm looking at a beam of light here, which is measuring, which is traveling with speed c, relative to an observer at rest in this reference frame. Then if I take a second observer, s prime, traveling with a velocity u, who also measures the speed of light here, then according to the Galilean transformation, the speed that this observer measures, c prime, should be equal to c minus u. Well, that's what the Galilean transformation says, but the constant speed of light says this is not the case. The constant speed of light says both observers should measure the same speed c. Okay. So, what I'm going to start today's class with is a presentation explaining how this is possible. How is it possible that in this situation here, both observers can measure the same speed c? And the Galilean transformation is wrong. Right, so this is the situation we're going to consider, which is the same as I just drew on the board. So we've got two observers. The first one is someone on the Earth, and the second one is on a rocket, which is moving at half the speed of light relative to the Earth. Okay? And both of these observers are measuring the speed of a single beam of light. Okay? And we want to work out how is it possible that both observers can measure the same speed for the light. So first we have to think about how do you measure speed. Okay? So the simplest way to measure speed is just to use the definition speed is distance divided by time. Right? So if I want to measure the speed of a car, say, I can measure the distance it travels in one second, for example. So for example here, if it, the car moves 30 meters in one second, then I know that its speed is 30 meters per second. So that's Simplest way to measure speed. Take a fixed unit, unit of time, like a second, see how far the thing moves, and then speed is distance divided by time. Okay. So let's try and imagine doing the same thing for the light. Okay. So as I've explained before, um, in reality you can't really do an experiment like this, but we are free to imagine an experiment like this. Right? So I have an observer on the Earth who's measuring the speed of light. So in one second, it looks like this. So here, all the units are 
times 10 to the 8 meters, right? So this is 1.5 times 10 to the 8 meters, 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters, okay? So in one second, the car, sorry, the light has moved to the position 3, okay? And therefore, the Earth observer calculates the speed of light 3.0 times 10 to the 8, which is correct, right? Now, if I do the same thing for the rocket observer, I give him a ruler as well to measure distance then you see that the rocket observer will only measure a speed of 1.5, right? So in one second, they all move like this. Relative to the Earth, the light has moved a distance of 3 times 10 to the 8, but relative to the rocket, it's only moved a distance of 1.5 times 10 to the 8, right? So the Earth observer measures speed 3, the rocket observer measures speed 1.5. And this is the prediction of the Galilean transformation. So how can it be different? How is it possible that this rocket observer can also measure 3 and not 1.5? That's what we need to work out. Okay. So the critical assumption you make when you derive the Galilean transformation is that the clock used by the Earth observer and the clock used by the rocket observer are the same. They behave in the same way. And also that the ruler, or the length measurements of the Earth observer, and the length measurements of the rocket observer agree. Okay. So these are the two assumptions you make when you derive the Galilean transformation. These assumptions turn out to be incorrect. Okay. It is physically not the case that the two clocks of the different observers agree, or that the measurements of lengths of the two observers agree. And by violating these assumptions, we can get the result we want, that both observers measure the same speed of light. Okay, so I'm going to explain three different ways in which you can do this. So the first is you make the assumption that when things start to move, they get contracted, they get squashed in the direction of motion. Okay? So in this case, relative to the Earth, the rocket is moving, and therefore, I again into this problem. Therefore, the rocket's ruler will be shrunk, okay? So we make this assumption. Because the rocket is moving, things that are moving are shrunk in the direction of travel, okay? And in that case, if the rocket's ruler is shrunk just the right amount, then you see you can get equal measurements of the speed of light, right? The Earth observer measures three, the rocket observer also measures three. So that's one way you can get the constant speed of light, okay? And this effect is called length contraction. Objects which are moving are squashed in the direction of motion. Okay. But it's not the only way. Another way is, is to use the difference between the clocks. As I said, the time measurements are also different. And in particular, if we assume that moving clocks run slowly, so that means the clock carried by the rocket, which is this one, this is the one clock on the Earth, this is the clock on the rocket. If we assume that the clock on the rocket is going slowly, so the rock clock on the Earth is measuring time as usual, but the clock on the rocket is going more slowly, then what happens? Well, after one second, it looks like this, right? One second is measured by the Earth, it looks like this, right? So therefore, the Earth measures 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per one second. That's right. But because the rocket's clock is going slowly, he hasn't measured a second yet. He's measured a bit less than a second. And therefore, he has to wait a little bit more until he measures a second. And in that time, the light has moved further, so he can also measure speed 3. Okay? So again, in this way, by using a difference between the clocks, we can get the result that the speed of light is a constant. Okay, I'll just show it again. So the, uh, the central idea is, because the rocket is moving, the time is going more slowly. His clock ticks more slowly. So one second on the Earth clock looks like this. He measures the speed 3. One second on the rocket clock looks like this. And he measures the speed 3. So that's another way you can get the result. A final way you can get the result is something known as relative simultaneity. This one is a bit harder to explain, so I'll try and do it clearly and slowly. Now, in fact, if you want to measure the speed of light, you really need two clocks because you need to measure the time at which the light is here, and then measure the time at which the light is here. 
right? And you can't do that using the same clock unless you have some kind of mirror to reflect the light back or something, right? So in reality, to do this experiment, you really need two clocks. And these clocks need to be synchronized. That means they need to agree on 0, 1, 2, right? They need to tick at the same point in time. Now, you can imagine that this idea of synchronization, simultaneity means at the same time, right? You can imagine that this is also relative to the observer. So, the Earth observer thinks that his clocks tick at the same time, but because the rocket is moving, the Earth observer, the Earth observer thinks that the rocket's clocks are out of time. So this is the effect of relative simultaneity. Because the rocket is moving, the Earth observer thinks that the rocket's clocks are out of sync. Right? And in particular, if you assume that the clock in front is behind in time, then again you can explain this constant speed of light. So here you see the, the rocket clock in front is behind this one in time. Right? And then after one second, what happens? After one second, it looks like this. All of the clocks advance by one second. Okay. So the Earth observer measures a speed of three. The rocket observer measures a distance of 1.5, but because of this difference in the clocks, he only measures a time of a half. Right? So again, he calculates three. Right? 1.5 divided by 0.5 is three. So this is the, the third and final way in which you can get constant speed of light. Because the rocket is moving, his clocks are out of sync from the point of view of the Earth's observer. Okay. And then in that case, everyone agrees the speed of light is 3. Okay. So we've seen these three effects, length contraction, time dilation, and relative simultaneity. These are differences in the space and time measurements of observers which are moving. Now, there's a problem which you might have thought of with these. I said that one of the postulates of special relativity is the principle of relativity, right? That's the second postulate of special relativity. And what it says is that you can't tell the difference between being stationary and moving. That's what the principle says, right? But here, I've told you there is a difference between stationary and moving, right? I've told you that the stationary ruler is long and the moving ruler is short, right? So in this explanation, I have violated the principle of relativity, right? Because I've told you stationary is different from moving. And that, that's a critical weakness. So just using length contraction, we can explain the constant speed of light, but we can't make it consistent with the principle of relativity. Okay? And the same is true of time dilation. Right? I told you that moving clocks go slowly. But again, principle of relativity says that you can't tell the difference between stationary and moving. Okay? So each of these explanations, length contraction, time dilation, and relative simultaneity, violate the principle of relativity. They tell you that moving is different from stationary. And therefore, they're no good um, as explanations on their own. Okay? So if I consider only length contraction, then that's no good. It violates that. If I consider only time dilation, that's no good. Right? If I consider only relative simultaneity, it's no good. But the amazing thing is, if you consider a combination of all three effects, so length contraction plus time dilation plus relative simultaneity, then you can make a situation which is consistent with the principle of relativity. So it is possible to make a situation where the Earth thinks, sorry, let's go back to this picture. It's possible to make a situation where the Earth observer thinks the rocket ruler is shrunk, but the rocket ruler all, sorry, the rocket observer also thinks the Earth ruler is shrunk. It's possible to make a situation where the Earth observer thinks the rocket clock is slow, but at the same time, the rocket observer thinks the Earth clock is slow. Right? It's possible to make a situation where the Earth observer thinks the rocket clocks are out of sync, but at the same time, the rocket observer thinks the Earth clocks are out of sync. Okay? So if you combine all three effects, then you can make a result which is consistent with the principle of relativity. Okay? 
And this is a unique result. There's only one possible way of doing it. Okay? And this is what dis defines the transformation of space and time in special relativity. Okay. So what we're going to do for the rest of this class is a bit of mathematics to work out what combination of length contraction, time dilation, and relative simultaneity do we need to be consistent with this principle. 